Namaste. Welcome to another episode of Yoga Vasishta. Today we're going to discuss the effect of studying and practicing the teachings of Yoga Vasishta. Let Brahma come here for a while, and in a moment we shall dispel his delusion as wind drives away clouds from mountaintops. After his mental dullness is removed by my reasoning, he will be able to rest in that happy state of mind to which we have arrived. He shall not only attain pure truth and a clear understanding of uninterrupted tranquility, but he will also secure a plumpness and beauty of figure and complexion, as one derives from a potion of ambrosia. He will become strong with knowledge of both worlds, exempt from the states of pleasure and pain. Then he will look upon gold and stones with an indifferent eye. So, as we discussed last time, Rama has been seized with depression. And now the sages, Vishwamitra and Vasishta, are coming up with a remedy for him. And of course, the remedy is the teaching of yoga. And not just any yoga, jnana yoga, advaita. So this is the teaching of Vedanta. This is the ultimate teaching of the Vedas. And here, the effects of this teaching are given and described very succinctly. That the first thing is, this teaching will dispel your illusion uh, it will get rid of your delusions by giving you the actual absolute truth the way it really is. Now, all truth expressed in language is relative. So this truth is also relative. Relative to what? The state of liberation, moksha, freedom from karma, freedom from birth and death, freedom from compulsion to act or not act. Now, this is very important because this state is the state of real happiness. We all want freedom. Huh? The cry of freedom has gone on for thousands of years. But what is it really? Freedom is simply the ability to do what we want when we want and not be forced and also not to do what we don't want to do. So a person who is actually free cannot be coerced because he knows that he is not the body, he is not the mind, he is not his emotions, he is not his thoughts, and he is not anything to do with this world whatsoever. How is that? Because the self is reality and the world is an illusion. Oh really, you say? <laughs> the world seems solid enough to me. Is it really? What happens at night when you go to sleep? The whole world disappears. Poof! It's gone. The body the senses, external objects, time, space, God and everything. <laughs> it all disappears and you find yourself in another world, the dream world. And this world is also remarkably detailed, self-consistent, although it may be wacky compared with the ordinary dream world. The dreaming dream world is just as illusory, just as temporary and changeable. The only difference is that the so-called awake dream world is a little bit more persistent. That's really the only difference. Everything else is pretty much the same between waking dreams and sleeping dreams. So what is going on here really? We are in a state of delusion. Of course, the uh, well-quoted example is seeing a rope as a snake. 
we see this uh, phenomena as a world and we ascribe to it all kinds of qualities and so on. And then we remember things that happen in it and then we use those memories to predict things and to desire things and to figure stuff out and so on. And this creates the mind. But all of these considerations are like the snake. The actual rope <laughs> is, uh, the actuality of it is, none of this really exists. <laughs> it's all a dream. And when you actually awaken from the dream, you can see this for yourself. In the beginning, you have to take it a little bit on faith. But if you follow this uh, course of action and meditation, if, if you imbibe the world view of this scripture, you will come to the same conclusion by your own observation. And this is self-realization. Religion is faith in the words of authority. Self-realization is coming to the same conclusions by your own reasoning, by your own observation. So to come to uh, give up this delusion that there's an external world with all kinds of objects and stuff going on, etc., etc., that there are other people, huh? other individuals, just like oneself, <laughs> or that oneself is an individual, and so on. All these are delusions, hallucinations, unreality. The only reality is God, pure consciousness, eternal, unlimited, boundless consciousness. And when one realizes that actually Myself, yourself, and everything around us is simply pure consciousness. That's when things start to get interesting. <laughs> so what else? Oh yeah, so we will attain the pure truth of this understanding and a clear understanding of uninterrupted tranquility. Well, what is that? If the world is an illusion, if the self, the ego, the individual, is a delusion, not real at all, huh? then anything that happens cannot affect us, good or bad, right or wrong. doesn't matter, because it's all a dream. Just like when we go to the cinema, or we watch a show on TV, or streaming, or whatever, <laughs> And then the end of the show comes and it's all finished and it's over. It was just an illusion. Uh, Ramana Maharshi used to make a, a very good use of the simile of the movie theater. That really, there's only a reflective screen hanging there. And then there's lights being projected on it. And yet, we get involved with it. We laugh, we cry. We're afraid for the hero, and so on. We hate the villain. <laughs> but it's all an illusion. It's just a picture show. And at the end, the projector stops, the lights go on, and all that there is is the screen, just like it was before. So consciousness is the screen. Consciousness is the mirror that reflects all these so-called objects and happenings and so on in the world. <laughs> and because of that, we get involved in it. We think it's real, like the men in Plato's cave analogy. They're seeing the shadows on the wall, thinking that's the whole reality. And they begin to spin stories about it, make theories about it, predictions and so on. Of course, most of the time they're wrong, but 
that doesn't stop them because that's all they have to think about, all they have to talk about. And it's the same with us. We're caught up in this illusion of the world. And Yoga Vasishta is to give us another view, to show us the magic, uh, how it's happening. And when we see that, we'll be cured of it. So we will have the knowledge of both worlds, both the world of reality and the world of illusion. This scripture is easy to understand and ornamented with figures of speech. It is a poem full of flavors and embellished with beautiful similes. One who has a slight knowledge of words and their meanings may be self-taught in it, but he who does not understand the meanings well should learn from a pundit. After hearing, thinking about, and understanding this work, one has no more need to practice austerities or meditation, repeating mantras, or performing other rites. A man requires nothing else for the attainment of his liberation. By deep study of this work and its repeated perusal, a man attains an uncommon scholarship and purification of his soul. So actually we discussed this verse a little bit last time, but I want to go deeper into it. So the language of Yoga Vasishta is very beautiful. It's embellished, ornamented, and decorated with many literary figures of speech. So it's a poetic work. It's not just prose, although the translation has to be prose because of the limitations of the English language. The original in Sanskrit is really very wonderful to read. It's not difficult Sanskrit, it's rather simple. The difficulty is in the deep concepts that are explained. And so because of that, it makes extensive use of similes, metaphors, comparisons, analogies, and examples. So as we went over in our old series, Matrix Learning, uh, which is a really good idea to go back and review. Uh, the problem with understanding things like this is with the meaning of the words. So if you have a good idea of the meaning of words, in other words, if you really have used your dictionary well, then you can study it on your own. Most people don't, <laughs> actually. They have a lot of misunderstood terms. So it's better to hear from someone who has realized it and understands it in their being. Now, after you hear this work and you contemplate it and you start to see things from its point of view, there's no more need for meditation or practice. Huh? No more need for practice because you're going to be living the reality. So no more mantras, no more sitting, no more puja, no more religious rites, huh? because you can directly see the reality as it is, just by knowing how to look. Enlightenment is a point of view. It's not that everything changes, huh? or the material world simply disappears, or something like that. No. But our point of view on it changes. We don't see it in the same way as we did before. We see that the snake is actually a rope and it can't hurt us. So that's going to be the result of really understanding this book. And there's nothing else required. So there's no external practices, no other uh, equipment or paraphernalia needed simply the words and the understanding in this book. So by that means, one acquires a certain rare scholarship. And what is that? Deep knowledge of Vedanta and Advaita. Not just the superficial knowledge that people go around spouting today. Oh, it's all one. And yes, everything is Brahman. Yes, yes. You know, those are just words. 
but to actually see the oneness, to actually experience the omnipresence of Brahman, that everything is consciousness. Uh, that's the actual result of this book because it will give you purification of the soul. That means no more material desires, no more care about the world, uh, which leads to actual freedom. Om Tat Sat Aung Harihi Aung Karunar Navamai Karadakadinal Gum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam